worked and studied in Belfast, Ireland, in Georgetown, Guyana, in Newcastle, England, and in Winnipeg, Toronto, and now Montreal. Importantly, in 1972, he joined the Pulp and Paper Research Institute of Canada, PAPRICAN, now FP Innovations, in Montreal, with a cross appointment in the Department of Chemistry at McGill University. Professor Gray has had an illustrious and prolific career. Briefly, his research focus has been on wood, pulp and paper, and cellulose, the chemistry and fundamental aspects of these materials, particularly the ability for nanocellulose and cellulose derivatives to form liquid crystals has been at the forefront of his discoveries. For this work, he was awarded the Anselm Payen Award from the American Chemical Society, which is the most prestigious award from the cellulose chemistry community. Professor Gray's contributions have also been in more applied areas. In fact, his contributions to scale up and the application development of nanocellulose earned him the 2012 Synergy Award for Innovation from NSERC. This is a model example of partnerships between universities and industry. In this case, McGill University, FP Innovations, Arbora Nano, and Celluforce. More recently, Professor Gray received the Marcus Wallenberg Prize in Sweden. This is essentially the Nobel Prize in Wood and Forestry Research, and it's awarded by the King of Sweden in a ceremony similar in grandeur to the Nobel Prize ceremony. And without a doubt, this is the highest honor in our field. So before I turn the floor over to Professor Gray, I want to re-emphasize that he's an exemplary researcher, supervisor, as well as a mentor, and I can personally attest to that. He's worked closely with over 60 students, postdocs, and researchers in his career, and they've gone on to be professors here in Canada, in the US, and in China, industrial researchers, and mill managers. In fact, the first woman mill manager in Canada was Julie Giasson, a PhD from Professor Gray's group. There are a few places at FP Innovations, Natural Resources Canada, and in pulp and paper companies around the world, including Resolute, Cascade, and Tembeck, that have not been influenced by Professor Gray and his trainees. And so with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Gray for his lecture entitled, Forest-Based Nanocellulosic Materials. Thank you very much, Emily. That introduction is a little over the top, but I'll, I'll accept it. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the organizers of this meeting, the departments at UBC, for the very kind invitation to come here and meet so many people that I know already and lots of people I like to know. So I'm very happy to be here. And uh, thank you all again. So. And we got, uh, that's the title. That's cellulose. Uh, it's a long chain polymer. It's made from glucose units joined very steri very carefully one to the other by Mother Nature. It's, it's available in every cell wall of every plant on the planet. But it's not present as synthetic polymers are, as individual molecules. It's present in aggregates, long crystalline microfibrils that exist in the cell wall. It's already a crystalline material. And it's the properties of cellulose. There are other polymers in wood polymers, as we all know, and I'm happy to acknowledge that they're important too. But I'd like to emphasize that you couldn't make paper if cellulose wasn't cellulose. It's the key property of the papermaking process. And papermaking, of course, has been key to the industrial forestry use in Canada. Nanocellulose, the second word in my, in my title, is, uh, it, it's a generic term that covers pure cellulose, but with one or more dimensions in a nanometer scale. It's very small. Basically, usually the thickness of a nanocellulose is of the order of maybe hundreds or thousands of molecules. So we're right down at the heart of matter. But, as I say, the in the plant cell wall, that matter is present as crystalline or semi-crystalline fibrils. And the big trick is to try to get it out of the plant cell wall 
without ruining the properties of cellulose. There are several ways to do this. Um, um, for, for many purposes, wood, it's fine that you keep the, the hemicellulose is there, you keep the lignin there, it all adds to the properties of wood. But if you want to make nanocellulose, you have to try to separate it out from these materials. And there are a range of different nanocellulose materials. I'll talk about um, that. Sorry. There's, and there's different ways of isolating them from the wood. The literature contains a confusing number of names for nanocellulose-derived materials. It started off as cellulose micelles, but there's, as you see, a bunch of names that have come up. But in this lecture, I'm going to focus particularly on two families of nanocelluloses. The CNC stands for nanocellulose nanocrystals, and CNF for cellulose nanofibrils. And that's the area I'm going to focus on today. How do you distinguish them? Well, basically, one, are, one is long and one is short. And thanks to Emily and her, uh, her supervisor, Bob Pelton at McMaster, they came up with this slide, which I'm sure she's sick of seeing, but uh, it really is so good. Basically, if you start with a tree, the pulp and paper industry is adept at turning it into pulp fibers. You can turn it into these two families of nanocellulose, and they're essentially one are long and one are short. So the long ones, moving up with primarily mechanical disintegration, you get a spaghetti-like material. If you use a chemical method of isolating, such as acid hydrolysis, you get rice-like material, that is, cellulose nanocrystals. So basically, long and short. And that's the long and short of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'll focus to start with on the cellulose <coughs> nanocrystals because, well, it's very interesting. Um, the challenge is you start with cellulose, and as I mentioned, cellulose tends in the plant cell wall to be crystalline or semi-crystalline. And what I've done here is indicate the ordered region. It's sometimes separated by disordered regions, more or less. And if you can remove those disordered regions, you end up with cellulose nanocrystals. And that's a sort of glib way of doing it. But if you try to explain this to chemists, I was in the chemistry department, I had a real trouble. I mean, what, what are you doing? Because you start with cellulose, you remove some cellulose, and you end up with cellulose. And what, what can be harder? What's smart about that? Well, I can tell you, you better get the condi conditions exactly right, or you end up with a bunch of sugar if you've overcooked it, or a bunch of lousy, weak pulp fibers if you undercook it. There's a very narrow range of conditions which gets good quality nanocellulose. And this has been known for a long time in Sweden. The first work was way back in 1949. And you can make it by other chemical means. There's an example shown here. But basically, the trick is remove the amorphous or easily accessible regions, and you're left with nanocellulose. Now, the nanocellulose, this is the sort of, this is a start. There was an unexpected <coughs> discovery. Now, we expected the nanocellulose, it's so small that we expected it to form a, a, a clear sort of solution. Uh, but it isn't a solution, it's a colloidal suspension. But the particles are so small that it looks clear like water. Except as you increase the concentration, it looks like viscous water. But if you keep increasing the concentration, a very strange thing happens. You start to see some new phase appearing. You've just got water, you've just got cellulose in there, but something seems to be happening down here. And what is actually happening down here is it's forming an ordered liquid crystal. A liquid crystal is simply a fluid which has got some sort of internal order. It's quite distinct from the crystalline order in the nanocellulose. Each particle in here is a crystalline particle, but the whole species here is sort of ordered, and it forms a separate phase. And if you keep adding more and more nanocrystals into this solution, it's into the water, this, oh, sorry about that, uh, the um, whole phase becomes ordered phase. And it's a liquid crystal, and it's known as a chiral pneumatic liquid crystal. And this was completely unexpected. 
uh, most liquid crystals are small molecules, uh, and here we've got a liquid crystal which is, contains maybe seven or eight percent of cellulose in water. So it was an unexpected phenomenon. The fact that it was ordered and it forms this chiral pneumatic order, I'll sort of sort of wave hands as to what that means in a little while. But there is an order in the solution, and this led to the second unexpected uh, observation. If you take that ordered phase at the bottom, it, it flows, it's mostly water, it's 95% water usually, but if you let it evaporate carefully, you end up with these sort of little colored iridescent particles. This was really, again, a, a total surprise. There's no pigment in there, there's nothing in there but cellulose and water. And it slowly evaporated. And this is a, a picture of uh, what happens. This is actually a mixture of different films where you cut out a little bit to demonstrate how, how pretty they look when you put them all together and show them in a black background. Okay, uh, this looked as if it might possibly be of some use. Uh, it certainly was of interest. It was an unexpected observation. But uh, because it looked like it might be some use, uh, we were able to patent it way back when and show that the color could be controlled by a very simple modification of the amount of salt, the ordinary common salt that you add to the suspension. Just a little bit of salt would turn the color from blue to red to green and you could uh, patent it and show that it was possibly useful for many purposes. So this is uh, the start of the nanocellulose stuff. Okay, um, this generated, seemed at the time at least, to generate a lot of interest. And at the time, there was a move in Canada to improve the security of the banknote system. Uh, and some of you may remember, a long time, may remember a long time ago that they started putting little colored planchettes into 20 bill notes. They were sort of, and they were made by a totally different process. And we thought, well, we can make pretty colors. There's something characteristic. You can control it. And it's pure cellulose. So you could mix it in with the paper-making solution quite easily. And it would be compatible with the paper. And it would have these properties. And what people used to do was try to sort unstick the planchettes from the 20 bill and stick it on 100. And so there was a... Uh, but um, our system, because photo, at this stage, then, Photocopiers began to get very good, and you could take a $20 bill and make a photocopy, and if you used the right paper, it sort of would pass muster as a counterfeit. You can't do that with these planchettes with our colored stuff because it doesn't photocopy. The color is iridescent. The colors change as you look at it from different angles. So we were really keen on this, and we tried a bunch of experiments and thought, well, you know, this is great. What could possibly go wrong with this idea? We got the patent. We got an idea Canada needed to improve the security of the notes. We knew the company that made the notes. We went and everything looked great. Well, there were a couple of problems. The drying process that led to this film formation isn't very well understood. And we hadn't tried to scale up to industrial quantities. But the real reason for the death of this idea was as follows. Unknown to us, the Bank of Canada planned to move from paper currency to plastic currency. Duh! And our stuff was useless for plastic currency. And the plastic, the, the, the Australians who invented the plastic currency had got all sorts of wonderful securities that you can build in. If you notice, you take your $20 note or your $10 note and look at it at different angles. The color changes dramatically. And there's a bunch of other things that they don't like to tell you that there's a security devices built into the paper. So it was easy to detect, and we were out of a job. It's dead. Duh. When faced with this type of um, you know, disappointment, go back to Mother Nature. And it turns out that Mother Nature in has used this iridescent type of material. And it was already known at the time. There were understory plants in the rainforests, tropical rainforests, that had iridescent colors in them. 
and they usually tended to be blue. This is uh, one of the first work that showed this, and subsequently there's been a lovely, m amazing work at Cambridge by Silvia, Silvia Vignolini, who's got, sorted the whole system out and had a whole bunch of others. But this is our nanocellulose film made from cotton, and you can see the color is much the same, and it behaves the same. It's iridescent, and if you look at it at different angles, the color changes the same way. So maybe there's something here that could be used. Now, you always like to demonstrate your stuff, you know? And everybody knows about these beautiful morpho butterflies that live in the, in the rainforests of Central and South America. Beautiful iridescent blue. So in a moment of weakness, I thought, ah, oh, well, maybe we could make a model that looked like these. So I got a pair of scissors out and cut the film out and tried to make a, 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 a butterfly with the same properties. Uh, it's iridescent, and I have to say here, in case there's a botanist or a biologist in the group, the morpho butterflies does not use this technique to turn itself blue. It uses a different interference technique. It's a structural color like this, but this is a rather particular, it's different from this one. There are beetles, tropical beetles, and in fact there's some in Canada that use this, uh, the same system that we use, but uh, the, the morpho butterflies don't. Anyway, here we got a butterfly, and it shows not only the, pro the iridescent properties, but it shows another interesting property, because the light that's reflected from our, these iridescent samples of nanocellulose is polarized, and it's polarized in a peculiar way. It reflects one hand of circularly polarized light. Without going into the, gory, the glorious details of what the difference between linear and circularly polarized is, light is, it's actually used every time you go to the movies and look at a 3D system, uh, cinema. And there's even some television sets briefly tried to use this system because what it happens is, in order to generate the 3D effect, the system uses two-handed circularly polarized light to generate an image, and when you put the glasses on, it looks like three dimensions. So, okay. So here's the glasses you can get, and you can buy them for a couple of bucks. And this is the, believe me, the easiest way to detect circularly polarized light. So here's our butterfly. Here's the glasses. When we look through this lens, the left-hand lens, it only lets left circularly polarized light out. So you can see the iridescence. On the other hand, it doesn't let right circularly polarized light out. So if you want to know whether your, your sample has got right or left circularly polarized light, you can save yourself a few hundred thousand dollars. Don't buy a, a polarimeter, just buy a pair of spectacles and have a look and you can tell that it's circularly polarized light. Okay, but now as, as Emily will tell you, in order to get anything accepted, this is not a very good idea to, to make do with just one sample. We've got to scale up. We've got to devise a system to generate very many samples. So I'm now about to demonstrate how to make butterflies and scale them up. You'll notice how useful this is going to be. Um, but anyway, the scale up was achieved by Tiffany Abbott Ball. Uh, she was working at this time in uh, uh, Israel in a lab there. And in order to scale up and produce a lot more butterflies, they used something that we had tried for a different purpose, that is casting the film into little molds that were made from basically uh, silicon plastic, shaped like a butterfly, and you add the nanocellulose solution just into those and let it evaporate. And what do you get? You get a load of butterflies. And <laughs> this was... Uh, and uh, with, in cooperation with some other students in the uh, university uh, in Tel Aviv, they devised this system. And it turned out to be a very beautiful system. And they were able to actually get a demonstration in several um, display systems that were exhibited in, uni in uh, museums in Israel and eventually in other places around the world. And you see this. We've obviously got a method of, she has obviously got a method of producing loads and loads of butterflies. So what's the point? If you look carefully at the, her display, you'll notice there's numbers under them. And this just goes to prove that you can do science and aesthetics and get things into museums 
all in the same experiment because the numbers indicate the criteria that she used to cause the hydrolysis, the conditions of hydrolysis and the conditions of evaporation. So every single one of those butterflies tells you something about how she made the cellulose nanocrystal solutions. So, um, uh, Tiffany is currently in Rice, Sweden and is trying to uh, get some jewelers to uh, scale up and use this as, as, as uh, yeah, jewelry. And so it's possible that this, this I can hope. But um, uh, those of you in your audience are probably hoping that there's some other uses for cellulose nanocrystals besides this rather eccentric use. And I'd like to mention one other thing. It's not as obvious, this whole evaporation process, and I'll be talking about that tomorrow. It's not at all obvious how it works. It, it, and what we notice, for example, if you take a droplet of, uh, uh, open droplet of cellulose nanocrystal, and just drop it on a glass, then you notice the colors range from red at the outside to blue in the middle. But if you take the same solution, put it under a cover slip so that the evaporation occurs from the edge of the droplet, lo and behold, the colors reverse. They're blue at the outside and red in the middle. What is going on? And this may not be just trivial because if you want to control the optical properties of cellulose nanocrystals for some high-tech uses, you better understand what's going on. Why the difference? Well, some of you, uh, at least I certainly, often drop, as my wife will tell you, often drop coffee on my nice new white shirt. And a stain is well known to occur. You get a dried coffee drop, and instead of being nice uniform brown, as the, the coffee uh, is spread evenly over the shirt, you always find that there's a ring forms. And this is known as the coffee stain effect or the coffee ring effect. And it's because colloidal particles are moved to the outside of the evaporating droplet. Now, that's not much use, except the colored chemists who like to talk about the coffee stain effect and do esoteric calculations to, to show what's going on. But if you start with our cellulose nanocrystals and look at the same situation, here's a droplet here. It's red at the outside, blue in the middle. But if you take a cross section of that drop, it turns out that at the edge is much thicker than at the middle. And that's exactly because of the coffee stain effect. It, the, as the water evaporates, it draws the particles out to the edge, so it's thicker at the edge than in the middle. And it's quite a spectacular effect. Um, um, this is a, a hand-waving explanation of what's going on. But uh, the uh, end result is this coffee stain effect is much more fun than the coffee stain effect produced by coffee. It's thick and it's colored. It's three-dimensional and technicolor. So this is, of course, of no use to mankind at all unless you want to try to understand how to control the, uh, the formation of these liquid crystals. So the bottom line is cellulose nanocrystals Form chiral-nematic liquid crystals and solid films. Okay. The pitch can be controlled. You can change the color quite easily by just changing the composition a little bit of the evaporation. And if you want to make iridescent pigments for cosmetics, for example, or surface coatings, these are non-toxic, they're renewable, they're easily, they're benign. They're basically plant-based. And one of the exciting things that Mark McLaughlin here showed, where is his, uh, Mark? He's got his shirt there, yes. His shirt is showing nicely in the fifth row back. Uh, he showed beautifully that not only can you can use the, uh, these chiral pneumatic cellulose films you, as a template, you can template all sorts of more exotic materials, get the same optical properties, but in, for example, in silica, or in other much more robust materials where you could not use cellulose. So anyway, uh, this, is, this is fascinating work and uh, it's, it's continuing here. Um, uh, the main challenge though, I think, is this controlling liquid crystal textures, the, how the, the colors form, what the films look like. 
and I'll be talking about that for any of the students tomorrow morning and in a good bit more detail. But if that was the only use for cellulose nanocrystals, we wouldn't be, we well, wouldn't be here. And there's been a whole bunch of proposed uses. This is, I stole this slide from Emily, um, and it's basically work, work at uh, uh, Richard Berry and Cellulose, and they've got publicity showing some of the many uses. Now, I won't have time to go into even naming what they are, but because the nanocellulose changes the fluid properties of water in small amounts, then one of the possible uses is in oil and gas recovery, where you use a gel to move the uh, residual petroleum out of, uh, out of wells. And uh, FP Innovations, and especially Cellulose, have had support to do that. I've mentioned this sort of pigments. The other big volume use might well be for these and other nanocellulose in, cell, in, in concrete and, and cement. And it isn't that they make it stronger, they control the evaporation of water so that the crystallization that, as cement cures can be controlled in a clever way. Um, plastics and composites Basically, they are reinforcing the nanocellulose in several different ways. It's been proposed as a reinforcing agent. And, uh, um, well, you can read the other uh, suggestions that uh, Richard Berry and company have come up with. That, that there's activity in this area is shown in this slide. Basically, it starts on one here from 1990, late 1990s, through to more or less the uh, middle of last year. The number of publications has increased essentially exponentially. They're indicated in red. But perhaps more significantly, the number of patent applications is still going up. Um, and surely some of these are going to bear fruit. Um, we sincerely hope. Um, and some of them will bear fruit because of what Emily does. This is looking ahead to other potential applications. I'm sure you've all seen Emily's low-density foams, cellulose foams, which are floating around it. Uh, just amazing. Um, the, these are basically um, a, a wonderful potential for insulating foams that use virtually no material. And what material it does use is renewable, recyclable, and so. Um, but this is just one example in the uh, colloid, food, pharma, and cosmetic applications. This is gel and film substrates, actually for biomedical applications. And uh, because, of course, cellulose is not a very toxic material. Unlike many other nanomaterials, it's pretty benign. And it's, as I say, renewable, non-toxic, and made by plants. And, uh, some applications are listed here. And the go-to person is Emily. OK. How am I doing? OK. Right. A little bit about you can't do stuff with stuff if somebody doesn't make the stuff. And luckily, there's a lot of people trying to make the stuff. And as you probably know, anybody in the industry doesn't like to be stuck with one supplier. And so that looks kind of hopeful. That there are a bunch of companies, both in Canada, in uh, Sweden, and around the world, that are developing processes for nanocellulose, CNC, cellulose nanocrystals. Still, by far, the biggest process is uh, in Cellulose uh, outside Montreal. Uh, but there are other competing processes coming along elsewhere. Cellulose. Uh, is actually the world's largest producer of cellulose nanocrystals. And they use the traditional, what's now become the traditional method, using concentrated sulfuric acid. And they use bleach craft pulp as the starting material. Uh, and if you want to understand uh, at least the technical uh, aspect, uh, Mike Reed is one of uh, Emily's co-workers. I've got this beautiful paper that benchmarks the nanocellulose, what works, what doesn't work. So she's very tactful writing the paper. But reading between the lines, you can decide who makes good nanocellulose and what you should try and how you should characterize it. 
So I think that's uh, uh, this is just a cellular force slide indicating what they think the main applications will be. Okay, At, to this point, it's fairly clear that the long fibrils are actually there's a bigger tonnage and there are more there's more interest in them in some ways than the more interesting to my mind cellulose nanocrystals and these are the long spaghetti-like materials. And the production facilities are here, and they're usually produced essentially mechanically, though almost inevitably there's a, a chemical or a biochemical step as the first step of softening up the pulp or the cellulose, source of cellulose before you use the mechanical process. And the most exciting, I think, uh, um, type of material are those that use this oxidation, a catalytic oxidation process to help isolate the individual nanofibrils. You can make them in many different thicknesses, and the thicker ones are directly usable and producible in pulp mills. So that's one reason for the exciting acceptance of these materials in industry. You can make them in a mill, you can use them in a mill. But, um, I think one of the most uh, exciting breakthroughs was this due to Professor Isogai in uh, Kyoto when they discovered that you could isolate these spaghetti-like materials actually as very beautifully uniform and very long uh, nanofibrils. Now, it did involve a chemical process, that's, and it's a kind of expensive process, but the properties are pretty, pretty unique. Um, and when you look at the production capacity here, by far and away at the moment, uh, of all, uh, an unexpected source was Nippon Paper, who have been working quietly at them for quite some time. And they've scaled up pretty big capacity of producing these tempo, long, thin, uh, oxidized, uh, they've got carboxyl groups on the surface of long cellulose nanocrystals. There are other companies coming along, but uh, that, that's the brand leader at the moment. Um, they have developed, at least, in, at least in one and possibly two big mills in Japan, uh, industrial processes for these uh, nanofibers. The, the, the thing that's amazing about this to me is you start with basically a, a dissolving pulp fiber, or uh, it's an article of commerce, and using this catalytic process, you end up with an amazingly uniform, amazingly thin uh, nano material. And they wouldn't be making it in this quantities if they did not have some uses for them. Now, the initial uses have been a bit mundane. And I hit to maybe, well, they make money. And how do they make money? This material turns up in high-end adult diapers in Japan. Now, you know, it's hard to get grants to make adult diapers. But those of us that are of more advanced years are probably quite happy that people are working on improving this type of product. Uh, I don't. I will. I will say nothing more about this. There is a second. <laughs> there is. A, there is a second use, and it was probably the first application. And they sell uh, ball pen pens in Japan, and you can buy them here actually, in which the flow properties of the ink is controlled by small amounts of their um, carbon. Uh, these type of nanofibers, because why does it do it? It enables the flowing, and it has an affinity for paper. They dry nicely, and it works very well. And I use the pens regularly, and I always feel it's very nice to... They're very clever. They give out the pens at conferences. So if you want, just keep your eye. Go to a Japanese conference on nanocellulose, and you're pretty sure that you'll get, a co uh, get one of these pens. Okay. However, that really... I mean, yeah, let's face it, those are pretty mundane uses, and they don't get... Your politicians very excited. However, now keep cast your eye upon this beautiful car. Basically, it is a Japanese 
and they call it a nanocellulose vehicle, NCV. And it's produced in cooperation with the uh, researchers that I've mentioned, the, nano, uh, the group at Kyoto and the pulp company that makes the nano, uh, nanocellulose fibrils. And basically, they claim that it reduces the weight. They use the nanocellulose as part of the bodywork and interior. And they claim it's saving about 10% by weight. And of course, politicians notice it's a gull wing, you know. But it's obviously not a production vehicle at this moment. But it's actually very clever, because you never know what the breakthrough really is. And it's not so much that you can use uh, nanofibrillar cellulose in the, to supplement strength in the, the plastic. It's why, how they do it. They, they've managed to make the flow properties of the extrusion work containing relatively large amounts of this nanofibrillar cellulose. So they actually extrude the material. It's, it's an injection molding process, which is what you really need for uh, uh, high quantity production. There are other ways of in incorporating nanofibers into um, carbon fibers, for example, into cars, and they've been known for a while. But this way, you can actually use uh, an injection molding uh, process, which is much better. It's more suited to mass production. So uh, the big question is, uh, big car companies are interested. The only th the stuff works. The only question is, can it be cheap enough? So we, they've got <laughs> it's always the question, can you do it cheap enough? They're, they're, they're with, obviously within striking distance, and this is a very exciting production. That they called it here, I'm going to, they did call this uh, a nanofiber wooden car. But really, face, let's face it, it's not a wooden car. But I can't, because there's lots of people here interested in high tech uses of wood, and I think that there's UBC and the Paralam building in which we stand is a, is a, 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 wonderful, a wonderful example of how you can use wood in novel ways. Uh, this is not a really a wooden car, but I can't resist taking a little sideline and pointing out, you can, if you want, buy, as we speak, a wooden car. Uh, for the last hundred years, the Morgan Motor Company in Britain has been making high-end sports cars, actually high-end because they cost a lot, they're bloody agricultural, <laughs> they're, they're no, the technology is not very advanced. However, they make the chassis out of ash wood, by hand, piece by piece. So if you really want to buy a wooden car, you can do it as we speak. The company made, made it through to 100 years, it's just been bought by a sold out from the fam. It was family owned for 100 years and it's just been sold. But anyway, they continue to make cars. So this, this is a wooden car. Uh, this is what it looks like. And they make a bunch of wooden cars. Some of these are <clears throat> very, uh, very dubious utility unless you happen to be making a movie or something you can, you can uh, do. It. But anyway, all the cars are three core elements, ash wood, for the body, aluminum for the body, and leather for the seats and other bits. So it's really a wooden car. Now, I don't know whether you should rush out and buy this for ecological purposes. As I recall, they're damn thirsty and they make a lot of noise and they don't go around corners very well. But you sure, <laughs> but they sure uh, draw if you happen to be looking for young ladies or whatever. You've got an open sports car that makes a lot of noise and anyway. Yeah. Okay, enough frivolity. Back to the nanofibrillar cellulose. There are other companies as well as the Japanese that have got really um, exciting, rather more coarse nanofibrillar materials. Um, this is a, a Norwegian company. It's always specialized in making useful stuff out of wood that nobody else makes. They sell lignin, they sell nanofibrillar cellulose, and several types of specialty cellulose, and they come up with this microfibrillar cellulose. 
And this is a Japanese company which has always been interested in cellulose and cellulose derivatives. I could go on at length about many of their products, but this one is good because you can use it as a binder. You can throw it into paper and it'll improve the strength of the paper. It improves food. It's used in food processing and for filtering. So there's a, there's a fair market for this. But it's a good bit thicker than the fibers that, the fibrils that I was talking about before. And Canada is not left out in this. There's, uh, well, it's, there's several names for it, but at the moment I'll go with filocell or cellulose filaments. And these were developed by FB Innovations, and now they're being made in joint, a joint company with Kruger and others. And these are much thicker, but you make them completely mechanically. There's no chemistry involved. About 100% of the fibers end up as, as uh, uh, the material. And there are lots of exciting proposals for how to use it, both in the pulp and paper industry and outside the pulp and paper industry. Uh, Kruger uh, was the company that jointly with FP Innovations built the first plant. Another plant just opened a month or so ago at the Conogamy Mill of uh, this is Res Resolute Forest product. Again, the idea is to use these materials both in paper making and for other much more high value added uses. Okay, summary. It's always dangerous to summarize this, but anyway, no matter what, wood-based nanomaterials will show all sorts of promise for all sorts of applications that nobody would have really thunk of maybe 25 years ago. CNC, that's the short rice-like particles. It was originally interest was in optical properties, but it's developed to cover a wide variety of uses because it changes for a very small amount the properties of water. And so water, cellulose, are key things. Uh, the growth and applications of the longer spaghetti-like materials, is, it's impacting fields as diver diverse as the paper-making field, which is great. Um, it, the industry will, li will likes that. But advanced composites will also be, could, can be improved by incorporating those uh, nanofilaments. We should be proud that Canadian universities and Canadian companies have played a leading role in this nanocellulose field. And I think UBC is particularly well placed at the moment to lead the research on a world scale in this area. I salute the graduate students. Work your butts off. We're ahead. We can stay ahead. OK, um, I have to thank, obviously, being here is attests to the, uh, the efforts of a whole bunch of different faculties, departments. I see and I include, they're on the slide here, um, the institutes and chairs, all within UBC. And you've managed to collect an amazing group of world class scientists. And this, this must work. It must work. And I, I, I applaud the forethought that has gone into this. My acknowledgments, and, and everybody acknowledges their graduate students, but boy, do I mean it. Um, this was where the Pulp and Paper Institute started off. I started off working for Paprikan, but it had a branch plant here with a cross appointment with McGill Chemistry. And uh, Paprikan staff also worked down in. Uh, in 3420, and the two staff members who were um, deeply involved with the first use of nanocellulose were Jean-Francois Raval and Louis Godbu, who were technicians and technical specialists with FB Innovations. The graduate students are listed here. Uh, Emily mentioned Julie Giesin, who did the first TEM. And actually, her thesis was the first to show that these were left-handed cellulose nanocrystals. Uh, the names, I, I will draw attention to Xu, Xu Min Dong, who did all the heavy lifting on the theory of why the phase separated. He, uh, uh, I owe a, a huge debt to Xu Min. Uh, the names of the others are familiar. Catherine Edgar came from UBC. 
Um, I've mentioned some of the... Uh, rather than go over everybody in the time, I just can't help mentioning that you notice Emily's name appears there and Tiffany Abbott Ball and some others more recently. All of these people worked, were wonderful to work with and I have to thank them and thank NSERC, which throughout my career has been able to give me a modest but continuous support to try new stuff. There's always money to do stuff that industry is going to like, but there's very little money to do new stuff, blue sky stuff, and NSERC have always been there in modest support to try new stuff. And at the start, of course, FP Innovations and Paprikan were behind this work. It was been fun. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we have some time for questions from the audience about the past or the future. Does anyone want to start us off? I think the room is small enough that we can hear you. So do we have questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I'm just curious, have you explored as well the piezoelectric properties of uh, cellulose, nanocellulose? Yes, that's very interesting. We haven't, but there is a great scope for uh, piezoelectric effect. We know it exists for cellulose, and it would be interesting to combine that with the chiral orientation. But I don't think anybody, as far as I know, nobody's done it yet. Uh, you know, there's maybe a couple of papers, but we didn't. It, it would be, again, fun. <laughs> Could you mention or comment on um, the dimensional st stabilization of, of this form of cellulose? What your favorite uh, stabilizing compounds might be and how effective they work? And I've heard siloxanes are used. Um, uh, at the moment, well, I would personally, I would avoid siloxins because they're under a bit of a shadow. Not so much the siloxins themselves, but the precursors, the chemical precursors, are under a bit of a shadow environmentally at the moment. But there will obviously be some applications that that would be a good idea. Dimensional stability is tricky. Um, I'm impressed by what's happening on a much larger scale. Right here, we're in uh, the dimensional stability of wood is always a problem. As the humidity changes, wood changes, swells in one direction but not in the other. But Paralam, for example, is a wonderful example of what you can do in this building of think of trying to overcome the inherent dimensional instability of wood by cross-lamination. Um, for nanocellulose, for incorporating them in uh, a polymeric matrix, you do want the, the problem is cellulose likes water, and if you've got uh, polyethylene as the matrix, the water can diffuse through, and you'll have problems there. The usual approach is to modify the surface of the cellulose so that it becomes more compatible with the matrix. Uh, I uh, well, you have to do this carefully, uh, and uh, I'm not an expert. People here are doing it. So, <laughs> Yes. You mentioned that we've assembled a wonderful team here yeah. at UBC. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would like you to perhaps to name the three big challenges for the wonderful team that we've assembled. Ah. Ah. Oh boy. <laughs> maybe, maybe two. Well, yes. Yeah, there are challenges. Well, the first challenge is. Uh, well, dimension stability is going to be one of them for many of the applications that are in composites. It still is a challenge. Um, the, the big advantage that you, well, we have in using cellulose is, of course, the cyclic, the circular nature of applications. Uh, you have to be careful when you're proposing a new set of properties for some one nanocellulosic containing material that you don't wreck the circular 
uh, availability. Sometimes you can pay. It doesn't matter if you've got 1% of stuff in there and you can burn it off uh, at the end of the, to recycle the other components. But it is, uh, you, you, you do, it, it, it is a challenge to see where it can work. And then, of course, this comes to the next bit, basically scale up. We were talking, I mean, we had, used to laugh when we found this at first. We were talking about uh, make, using megatons of nanocellulose. I mean, it's just, that's 10 to the 9, 12 difference in scale. It's not going to, there's not an obvious match there. But in fact, uh, when you look at things like um, the concrete uh, use in the, uh, um, anything that involves a large amount of water and a small amount of cellulose, you're ahead because you're not using a synthetic polymer, you're using a natural polymer that Mother Nature knows how to deal with. Otherwise, we'd be feet deep in rotting wood, but the wood, dis the wood disappears. So um, it's, that, that, that's one challenge. And of course, the, the other challenge, of course, is the, is the scale up bit. Um, there's, there's always a start of a field, and then nanocellular is going to save the world. We've been more or less through that. It doesn't seem to have saved the world yet. So there's a, uh, you lose enthusiasm for it. And say, oh, that's been done. And nobody has found quite the right click just to, to, to the aha, the big use, use. And maybe we shouldn't look for the, the big killer app. You should just look for all the apps and Mother Nature. Well, and naturally it'll happen. And who can tell? It's very difficult to predict ahead of time what is going to be useful and what is going to be forgotten in a month. So the answer is the, it's the future. Who knows? <laughs> yep, we had another question here. So, it's a fascinating lecture. Yeah. The, the, the commercialized um, microfibrillated cellulase that you mentioned. Did we commercialize? Commercialized uh, microfibrillated cellulase. Micro? Yeah, I think it's produced in Okay, the question was, have we commercialized the macrofib? Oh, no. no, okay, sorry, try again. Probably <laughs> my accent. Um, yeah, you mentioned um, mic a chemical-free, um, like, microfibrillated yes, yes, cellulose product yes. that's been commercialized. Y yes. Um, does that just use the standard um, aspirin defibration process, um, uh, or has there been a... Are you giving a modification to that? To it's it's yeah. subtly different. Mm -hmm. What happened at FP Innovations, and I guess Gilles Doris was the driving force, hit the sweet, pot, sweet spot where you apply just enough energy to break it into usable um, um, cellulose, fib um, mm -hmm. the, um, cellulose fibrils with just the right amount of energy so that you break it up enough so that you've got novel properties and flow, but not so much that you've wasted energy in going and just over-refining the cellulose. So it really was a, a subtle and careful investigation of the, the defibration process, the usual mechanical processes. It uses standard mechanical equipment. It uses a, your regular refiner. There's no pretreatment. And that's why they're so happy. You could do it in a mill if you watch carefully what's happening. Maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I was, it, it was really a triumph in some ways of um, a purely mechanical approach to breaking up standard wood fibers into a novel uh, suspension. So there's no gain to be made from trying to produce like nano-sized um, fibers um, using a mechanical well, process. Yeah. Uh, I hesitate. Yeah. My feeling is that the, the nano, the, 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 what the, the process that we see at the moment are pretty damn good for breaking up what was a chemical pulp into these nanofibrils. And it's been, uh, I'm not sure that I see any novel, there could be a novel chemistry to do the nanocrystalline cellulose, and I think there is a novel chemistry coming along, but that's simply chemical. It'll end up with the same type of material. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any other questions for Professor Gray? 
Can you yell, Sean? It'll take me a while to get to you. So nature makes different types of cellulose. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you might comment on some of these wonderful properties you see from cellulose that might be monoclinic versus triclinic, and if there's any difference in the properties. Um, well, uh, <laughs> Emily's a person to speak to where you could move from not, not simply monoclinic to triclinic, but cellulose 1 to cellulose 2. Uh, and the answer is, I don't know yet. Do you know? It's different. It's different. There you go. <laughs> There's a poster out there. We can talk yeah. about it. And I have some comments on that as well, but yeah, it's different. Um, I don't, I can't honestly see it for, from the traditional cellulose nanocrystals. Just because of the abundance of Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, I, I, I don't think there's a sufficient difference to make it easy to capitalize on one form rather than the other, as, we, as at the moment. Who knows? Who knows? Um, we find that there's some Mother Nature occasionally makes a suspension of cellulose that'll form a liquid crystal already, but it's stabilized by rather complicated mechanisms. There's lots to be learned. Okay, uh, with that, let's thank Professor Gray again for a lovely lecture. And I'll let him sit down because I have a few more announcements. So the first is that, as you probably saw when you came in, we have posters uh, from the Faculty of Forestry and the Bioproducts Institute. And so those posters and their presenters will remain here for another hour and a half or so. So I hope you'll have time to join our reception, to grab a drink, and to talk to some of the poster presenters and see the research that's going on here. Um, if you registered before February 21st online and you haven't checked in at the front desk, you can go there to pick up your drink ticket. Uh, but please don't all go to the bar at the same time. There's only one bartender. Okay, and so um, the last thing to let you know about um, is that I would like to introduce Professor Yusri El Kasabi, who is the Associate Dean of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, and he is going to be announcing the winners from our poster composition. Good with that? Okay, thanks. The moment we